We are Vineyard. I started seeing God's heart for people, and I I just started weeping and breaking over people who I'd walk into a restaurant and I I'd look around and I think, oh, there's 50 people here. I wonder if they have a church to go to. I wonder if they know Jesus. I wonder if they even know. I wonder if they know how much God loves them and cares about yeah. them. And so began my journey. We call around here the value of one more. Mm. That we're always looking for one more because Jesus is always looking for one more. Mm. And so began my journey. If this is the passion you've given me now, how can I create, design, orient a weekend meeting that I could invite people to and that we could invite people to that wouldn't freak them out like I did growing up in the church I grew up in mm -hmm. and had some meaning and had some more significance some of the churches I was a part of. Mm -hmm. But how can we do that? How can we do that? All I can say is God has been faithful to allow the Miami Vineyard Church to be a catalytic church mm -hmm. that people invite their friends to. Welcome to the We Are Vineyard podcast, conversations to help us grow with Jesus and each other. In today's episode, our host, Jay Pathak, is joined by Kevin Fisher. Kevin is the senior pastor at the Miami Vineyard. Let's listen in. Well, uh, Kevin, thanks for joining us on our podcast. Appreciate it. You are welcome. Yeah, this will be fun. I in and you know, I'm sure you've memorized every single one of these, so this is not important to say, but it's really just your story. That's really all we want to hear. And I'm just beyond excited for people to hear more of your story because you know, the legend of the Miami Vineyard moves across the whole movement <laughs> because you've done <laughs> such a great job. Truly. I mean, just such a great job. And you, you know, you've hosted any number of events and everybody loves to be with you. But, you know, often we don't get time to hear people's stories, to kind of understand how they've become this kind of person and how a church like this forms. So I'm really excited to have you tell a bit more about you to all of us. I'm Thank you. Truly, Thank you. Yeah, excited I really to be am. Here. Well, because I've got, you know, we've gotten to spend a decent amount of time together. Yeah. And like, yeah. Loose time talking, mm -hmm. sharing mm -hmm. stories, sharing dreams. And so, you know, I I have a lot of respect for you and I love the way God has built your life and your leadership. So anyway, I'm, I'm excited. So let's start where you start, which is where you were born and grew up. Yeah. Where was so, that? yeah. So I'm a, I'm a transplant to Miami, although I've been here for for many years, mm -hmm. I was born in Green Bay, Wisconsin, literally in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Wow. Uh, St. Mary's Hospital in Green Bay. Grew up on a dairy farm about 15 minutes outside of Green Bay. So kind of a rural area, but close to close to Green Bay. Hmm. I was born in the shadow of Lambeau Field. Oh, the legendary. Yes. And so, <laughs> look, if you grew up in that part of the country, you... Oh, no, it's it's an altar. Yeah, it's... A, yeah, <laughs> it's you, you, you are born a Packer fan. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, but I grew up on a dairy farm. I mean, uh, that's... I grew up, went to, you know, got to be 18 and told my dad, Dad, um, I love you and thank you for the opportunity to be a farmer, but that's not me. Right. So... But how many kids? So you're, it, where are you in the order of all your yeah, brothers so and sisters? Mom and dad had seven kids. I'm number wow. two, six boys and a girl. Wow. And then my mom adopted another girl who was 16. Mm. I'd already moved out already. So I have another sister from Guatemala wow. named Angie, Angela, Angel. And uh, so she's part of the family as well. So, wow. And so were you like farm boy? Like you're up in the morning. Oh, yeah. Milking the cows. Oh, like, yeah. Slinging the hay around, mucking out the stalls. doing. Yes. It's like we're doing all the things. Like And six boys. So we're all out there. Oh, yeah. Listen, by the, time away. We, by the time we turned 10, we hit the farm. I mean, we're up at, we're up at the crack of dawn. When we wow. turned 10, we're up at 5.15 in the morning. We milk cows. We did the chores. We took a you know, breakfast, slammed on breakfast, took a shower, went off to school, came back from school, did the same thing again. 
you know, we didn't have to, our parents didn't have to send us to bed. We begged to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there, there's a lesson there. Yeah. If you have kids that don't want to go to bed, find more physically challenging things for them to do. We did. We said, no, we I get to go it. To bed. And, and look, this is what, what I think what a lot of people don't know is dairy farming is not five days a week. Right. This is seven days a week. Cows yes. have to be milked twice a day, seven days a week. So there's no Christmas, there's no Easter, there's no any of this. And and it was a man, my hat's off to dairy farmers. What a what a what a deal yeah. they have. Wow. And so you grow up in this industrious, hard working, yes, 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 intense yes. family. And were your parents both sort of born and raised in the US? Yes. Okay, so they're they're Americans, yes. born and raised in the U.S. And what was their family of origin? Where did they come from? Uh, European descent. Okay. I'm my dad from Germany. My mom's got a lot of French in her. Okay, so they had moved maybe. They, so they were born in the U.S., but their parents came as farmers. Like, did they move? Yes, near my, there. So this is like the family biz. Yeah, on my dad's side. Yes. Wow, fascinating. Yes. So yes, generations yes. of like hardy farming yes like stock my my grandfather started in canada and then moved to wisconsin which is kind of south canada and, uh, <laughs> yeah yeah eh? exactly. <laughs> okay so then so you're raised in this like generational family of farming and work ethic and milking cows and waking up the crack of dawn and doing mm -hmm. all this stuff mm -hmm. how much is like faith a part of the story like are you church people do you go to church on sundays is it like the center of day-to-day -day life yeah so faith faith became a huge part of my upbringing mm -hmm. uh, my, my it, it was it was always a part my dad my mom and my dad were both very devout catholics mm -hmm. and it was a big part of of their life so much so that that my dad even though he didn't make a ton of money he sent all of us boys that there's we're right in a row we, we when we were in high school we were senior junior sophomore freshman wow they were they were good catholics right you know they didn't right. totally. they didn't they didn't stop it <laughs> 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 so but my dad because uh, and, and they were so devout that my dad sent us all to catholic school parochial school we were in wow. private school uh, wow my so i went to i went to catholic school first grade second grade third grade fourth grade Hmm. And my other brothers, accordingly to, to, to their age, but but when I was, I remember this when I was about eight. It put me in second grade, eight or nine. Uh, my mom and my dad had a radical uh, conversion hmm. to Christianity. Wow! And they 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 their experience was part of the charismatic renewal movement oh. of the late sixties and early seventies. Yeah. And they were, they were like, you know, when somebody goes a 180, even though they were, mm. you know, they knew Jesus about Jesus, they didn't, they knew about Jesus, but they would tell you they didn't really know Jesus. Right. And so they met Jesus and they got mm. infused by the power of the Holy Spirit and everything changed. That was a game changer. My dad, who, my dad, a lot of farmers are, are in that area are what I'd call weekend alcoholics, where mm. they just on the weekend, they go to the local bar. There's bars everywhere up there. They get drunk on the weekend and then, you know, repeat it. And uh, my dad, when my dad, that conversion happened, my dad stopped drinking like that, just immediate. Wow. Uh, my dad had a huge anger issue that was passed mm -hmm. on generationally. Mm -hmm. But as he, as this change happened, I even as a kid, I was eight years, seven, eight, nine, ten. I watched my dad become more mellow. I watched him become softer. Wow. I watched him become more loving. I watched him become less angry. Wow. And uh, and so so they had this radical conversion. And then so much so that they 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 couldn't really find a church that that kind of was them. Mm -hmm. So I grew up from a spiritual perspective, having having attending church in my living room. Wow. So what do you mean? So they would just host people? They'd yes. come over and do prayer yes. and worship yes. and Yes. Yes. And they actually, as the years went by, they actually then incorporated and became a, 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 a independent kind of a church with my mom and my dad. 
serving as co-pastors. Wow. So it was like church planting, like sort of accidental church planting. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Wow. And they they had they had quite an impact in the community, not so much on lost people, mm-hmm. but similar to I would call it vineyard early days where where it was people that looking for more. Christians yeah. looking for more. People yeah. coming say there's got to be more, there's got to be what's up with this Holy Spirit kind of a thing. And mm. so so they would people would come and and they had they had they had quite an impact from that perspective, wow, on the on the the community and and the rural community, but even even I would say even some impact on Green Bay, dude, that's incredible. And do you have a sense of like what kind of meeting it was they were at? Were they in a small group? Did they meet someone? Where where did these? Do you, do you remember? Or do you know how these encounters kind of started? happening in their in their life was it just in their church like their local parish i you know i don't know for sure i i i don't know for sure i i know they were tightly associated with an assembly of god church in green bay interesting okay and i i believe that I, I, some of it came from from that influence but right but i was a, i was a kid so i didn't yeah how would you know right i didn't totally. you know i was running around playing basketball i didn't have you know I just know yeah. all this stuff was happening in the periphery and also affecting my sure. life as well to some degree. Yeah. Because, you know, the spillover and those kinds of things. Well, at 8, 9, 10, you can already see transformation in your oh, family. Clearly. And then they're sort of hosting meetings. So you're kind of in the middle of whatever that is, you know, in, oh. in your house and people are visiting and I mean, doing it was, all the things. I mean, this was full on charismatic renewal kind of things. I mean, <laughs> speaking in tongues and... And wow. and people getting set free from demonic oppression. Wow. I mean, we would be upstairs in the farmhouse trying to go to sleep at nine o'clock at night. My mom and dad were having meetings with people in the living room. And, wow. You know, I'm hearing people at times as a kid, I'm screaming and I, yeah. I know I know now what that is, but right. back in back in the day, it's like, what is happening? What is this? <laughs> <laughs> but it's so it's so powerful to think about growing up like that and seeing that stuff right in front of you, I mean, is amazing. And so by and large, was that positive? I mean, by the time you're getting out of school, you're like, I, I'm not a farmer. I got to move on, do my own thing. Are you kind of like, man, this thing with Jesus is like hopeful, it's positive, it's encouraging, or is it kind of like, man, this is kind of bizarre, <laughs> and I got to do something else. No, because because it could go either way, right? I mean, it yeah, isn't absolutely. it isn't straightforward how that's going to break. I mean, no, it can go either way. And you know, I'm I'm like I said, I got six brothers and a sister. And if right. if you if you line up my family right now, yeah, uh, it, it goes went, all directions. Right? It went all directions. Sure, it went all directions. For yeah. me, in the midst of all of that, my mom and dad were very well grounded in, in Orthodox mm-hmm. Christianity and faith, which mm-hmm. imparted to me and to all of us, which I yeah. really am grateful for. So for me, it it was a the only adverse effect was I didn't want to be that type of Christian. Mm. What do you mean by that? What type? I mean, it was the packaging. Yeah, the packaging. I didn't I didn't want that packaging. I didn't mm-hmm. I didn't you know I, I didn't want to have to look like this or act like that or, or be like right. that or I, I didn't even want necessarily want to do church like that. Mm. I didn't like the packaging. Because it, it, it seemed didn't, weird. It seemed. It seemed weird. It seemed. It just seemed right. weird. It, it didn't suit right. me. <laughs> right. It, it didn't. Right. It wasn't. It wasn't me. And and number right. two. And and number three. If I ever thought about bringing a friend, yeah, I never did. I never would. Mm. Because that's weird, and I don't want that. I don't even like it. So why would I invite someone to it? Yes. Yes. So by the time you're graduating, you're going. You know, I. I believe in this. I love Jesus. I, and, and I, I and I love the power. This. I love the power of the Holy Spirit. I witnessed, mm. but I didn't like the I didn't like the packaging. Right. So you're getting a new shot. Like, hey, I get to like figure out who I want to be. I'm 18. Yeah. I'm going to launch out. Figure out something else. So I go off to a Christian college. Right. Because okay. I, because I I was I was a first generation college student. Yeah, I mean, wow. I didn't even know what college was. To be honest with you, I was a, you know, mm. I, so 1981, I'm going off to college. Mm. I didn't have any experience. My parents had no experience. And in my mind, 
Because, mm. you know, you didn't have social media back in the day. What, you, right. what, what, what did I know? I only knew what my mind thought. I thought Christian colleges were, were <laughs> like women all wore dresses and guys all wore suits and ties. And right. I, I don't know where I saw that, maybe on TV someplace, but that's what I thought <laughs> Christian colleges were. And I, I said, that's not me. I'm not doing that. I'm not. Right. I'm, I'm sorry. I love you, Jesus. I hate the package. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, and so I said, I said, I'm not doing that. But we found a Christian college in a Campus Life magazine. Hmm. Uh, I did. I found it. I found an advertisement for a Christian college called Northwestern College in Orange City, Iowa. Hmm. And and the, and the advertisement was was two guys jumping center jump, tipping a basketball. And I played basketball through high school. Oh, okay. And then I walked on my freshman year and played in college as well. So when I saw two guys playing basketball at a Christian college, I said, "What in the world?" This blew my mind. Like, can this be? Isn't and this so, stuff amazing to think like whoever does that advertising, like I think we all, and I know this will get to some of your story later. We all underestimate the power of just advertising, saying out loud what we're doing, what we're not doing. Like mm -hmm. you see one ad in one magazine, one time, unaware of how any of this stuff works. And you're like, I'm going to do that. Like I, I did. Wild. <laughs> I was I, I was sitting in the in in the waiting area of my guidance counselor's office at, at my senior year, and all of us all of us got called in one by one to say what we're going to do with our life. Wow. Well, I didn't I didn't even really know, but I'm sitting there. I wanted to go to a Christian college, but I'm ruffling through this Campus Life magazine, which happened mm. to be in this public high school, and I saw this ad. I kept the magazine. I walked in his office. I plopped it down. I said, "I'm going here." He said, "Have a good life." And that's what I did. <laughs> That's, so you apply. The, that's I know a true this, story. I know that's what's so amazing about this stuff. Like this, this, these major moments of our life turn on these kind of strange incidental things. I had I no mean, recom I had no recommendation from anyone. I didn't know anyone. <laughs> it, it, it was it was five hundred miles away from my house. Wow. You know, across across two states. Yeah. And, and I just said I'm going here. I applied, got accepted. My my mom corresponded a little bit with with the school to make sure it was you know orthodoxy was yeah was, is this okay right yeah yeah because people got the name Christian college but they're not always sure real Christian <laughs> totally and so so off I went so you uh, just appear sight unseen I don't know anybody I don't know anything about this I'm just going to appear at this school and the truth of it is Jay if I would have went to the school. <laughs> I would have never went to the school. Because <laughs> it's rural Iowa. I oh, mean, you're like. Yeah, there was nothing. <laughs> My high school was bigger than this school. If well, I would, if I would have went to, if I would have visited, I would have never attended. But, right. You know, but in God's in providential ways, uh, I showed up day one. <laughs> it's where you go. Parents, parents I me love off. this stuff. <laughs> this stuff is so great. I mean, and, and what's so amazing is how many of our lives really do work like this. Like one little thing, one invitation, one sign, one advertisement, one conversation, and everything yes. turns. Yes. Like, boom. The whole your whole life. You can look back and go, that was a gateway. So yes. okay. So you so you do that. So now you're gonna you're walking on to play basketball, and what is it? Have a denominational background? It does. Re RCA Reformed Church of America. Wow. Okay. So all of a sudden you go from Catholic to Pentecostally charismatic vibe to oh, yeah. RCA. Like yes. boom, boom, boom. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I love it. Again, these things are just so great. And then, and I do they have like chapel and all the yes. church stuff? So now you're in this other world five of, days a week chapel wow so it's uh, real got to take bible courses to graduate which i, which I wanted yeah you know, all that stuff sure and so is that so is that a positive experience now you're going man i feel like i'm learning new things about how my faith works or is it more like man i've ended up in a strange land i don't know what this is yeah no it was a it, college was an extremely positive experience for me mm. um the people i met no question, God ordained the chaplain at mm. the college. And he, if you ask him to this day, he'll tell you the same thing. Mm. He ordained him to be there for those four years I was there. Because really? the chaplain, yeah, he was such a great, great, great guy. Not only did he, he mm. just didn't function as a chaplain. He he started a small group. He, he handpicked 12 guys mm. my sophomore year. 
And I didn't even know the guy. So mm. how he picked me out of 1,200 students was beyond me, mm. but he picked me as one of the 12. And then he discipled us for a year. Wow. Uh, once a week in a dorm room, discipled us for a year and then said, look, wow. next year, you're going to have your own group. You're going to disciple these guys. And next year, they're going to disciple those guys. Wow. And he initiated small groups and discipleship on campus. Mm. And I was part of the groundbreaking effort of that on campus. And that was my introduction to small groups yeah. and the power of small groups. Wow. That, see, and again, like, and what did discipleship mean? So you're like reading the Bible. Oh, yeah. Praying. Yeah, his, he was so much bigger than, than, than RCA. Uh, hmm. you know, he was so much bigger than that and broader than that. And so, yeah, he would, he would teach us from the Bible, like life hmm. lessons. And then, we, you know, we'd have our own discipleship time. And then, then we would take those lessons he taught us and impart them next year and impart them next year. Hmm. Wow. I mean, so this is like navigators kind of campus crusade, some kind of like really intentional discipleship process. Yes, but it had a real organic feel to it. Hmm. It had, which I loved. I mean, I mean, I call it organic now. Back in the day, I didn't know what that word meant, but right. But looking looking back on it, it was a just a just a huge blend of of intentionality, hmm. but with an organic feel to it. Yeah, just relational health. Like I'm yes. connected to this guy. Yes, yes. And I'm reaching out to some folks I know. Yes, doing the next thing. Wow, yes. that is uh, what a great ministry training. Oh, environment it was phenomenal. Because phenomenal. Up to that point, are you thinking, maybe I'll be a pastor? Maybe no. I'll do ministry? No. Okay, no. Okay. <laughs> okay. So what What were you thinking? Because this is real. I, I mean, you're doing real ministry to do that. I mean, that's like. Yeah, no, I was doing real ministry for sure. I, I didn't. Yeah. In addition to that, in addition to that of, of being on campus, I, out of my own accord, I. <laughs> And again, you're just, you know, you're in college. I, I'm not even thinking. I'm just, I'm just doing. Just doing stuff. Right. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So I started, a, I started a, with, with a couple of friends. I, mm. I, I just, you know, because Jerry Sitzer was his name. He just said, man, just, just, you know, hey, if you get some ideas, just go, just go do it. So I started a, mm. I started a, a, my own prayer Bible study in my lounge of my dorm on Tuesday nights. Wow. It started with uh, me and four friends and. Uh, my my now wife Debbie, who I met at college, uh, mm. she played guitar a little bit. She she'll tell you a little bit. She knew three songs, and we sang the same three songs. And I would teach a lesson from the Bible, and this thing grew from four people when we started to like we had we, we were packing out the lounge with fifty sixty college kids. Wow! And actually, I found out recently because my 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 son now attended there mm. thirty years later, whatever something like that. And, and that, that meeting in that, that college dorm room became known what they call now their Sunday night praise and worship. Really? That they never had before. Wow. I didn't even know. I was just young and just doing and, stuff. Yeah. And just, just doing what I, what I sense God calling me to do. So you're doing kind of church plant ministry things unconsciously because some Correct. guys like, Hey, come do this thing with me. Correct. And then you're like, you know, we should probably do this other thing. And Correct. You know, this girl can play music and whatever. <laughs> Let's do this. Let's just try this. And so, but at the time you're still like, I don't know if I want to do ministry. I, I want to do this other thing. I didn't even know I had a, a gifting for it. <laughs> yeah. right. I mean, I'm serious. I, I believe it. Listen, I man, even, I believe you. I know. I didn't even, I didn't even know it. I just I know. was, I just was, just was doing. And then. So I graduated with, a, with an education degree and I was mm. a school teacher. And now I knew when I graduated and, and our, our chaplain told us, he said, look, he said, this training you guys have just had for three years from me. Yeah. He said, I just want to warn you, you might walk into churches where you're more spiritually mature and yeah. more passionate than the pastor. Right. Okay. He told us that. Yeah. But still, the, the, nothing clicked with me. Only, only this. Here's what clicked with me: I was going to go. I was going to be a school teacher, and mm. I was going to, I was going to serve in some church, and I was going to be the best servant that church ever had. Yeah. Wow. What a what a dream. I mean, that's how, how much do we hope people are imagining that as they come in our churches? Yeah. I'm here to serve and be the best servant 
you can have in this. I've started. Church. I've started praying for, pa- for, for for Kevin and Debbie's to to show up at at Miami Vineyard yeah, because if Kevin totally. and Debbie's would show up like that, dude, we could rock the world. You can do anything you want. Totally. Yeah. Okay. So so you have, you have this incredibly formative experience. Now you're going to be a teacher. Where do you yes. go teach? Where's your first job? My first job is being hired at an inner city, urban, oh, uh, junior high school here in Miami Dade County. Wow. So, so you go from Green Bay to Iowa. Yes. To urban Miami. Yes. Yes. So I graduated college and, and I, I, I hated the cold of Green Bay. I just hated the cold. Mm. I love my family, but I hated the cold. Right. So if I, could, if I could get to someplace warm and if I didn't get there right after college, if you don't escape those areas up there, <laughs> you don't. <laughs> right. In that moment, in that moment, if I you know. don't escape in that moment, know, totally. you don't escape. <laughs> this is my window. Right. I got to seize it. So you just so, are working like, you know, job boards, trying to look for stuff that's out there. I no, I met. a So when I was in college at Northwestern College in Iowa, I met a Miami guy, which is highly unusual. I was going to say, yeah. how does a Miami guy get there? <laughs> anyway, anyway, this Miami dude got there. <laughs> He's a follower of Jesus. Mm. We connect. We become best friends, and mm. we we relocate to Miami together. I I'm at actually his mom's house, renting huh. a room at his mom's house. You know, trying to get my feet under me, and I applied for a teaching position here. I didn't have to do job boards or anything. I mean, when they when when they saw a a young white male who they could place in one of these urban settings, right? That's what they did. And back in the day, they place you. They place mm. you in a school. And that's how they get you to integrate the school. And if you don't, if you don't say yes to that placement position, mm. you don't teach in the county for a year. Wow! You're so penalized. you put yourself in the pool, and then they yes. go, "This is where you're going." That's exactly right. Wow, that's intense. And at this time, are you dating Debbie? Are you guys getting? Are you still together, or is it more like I just kind of move down uh, to Miami? That's, that's a whole other story for another. Okay, podcast. okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, so I'm but, I'm going to go the, with no on that. <laughs> the, short, the short answer is we're still friends. <laughs> okay, okay. But a year later we get married. Oh, okay. So the Lord brings. So she's that a year behind around. me in school. Right. And okay. I moved here without her. But I see. Okay. I went back and got her, married her, and brought her. Back. Oh, that's so great. Okay. Okay. I just because I was just wondering. So you you've already been starting ministry together in this yes, yes. kind of accidental way. Yes. But now you moved to Miami. And now, boom, you're in an inner city school. Now, I'm, I'm going to make a little assumption here, and you can tell me if I'm wrong. But when you're in Green Bay and in Iowa, my hunch is that the racial diversity is pretty low. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I know it's an assumption. Okay? Yeah, 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 an assumption. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just say that you are incredibly astute. <laughs> yeah, okay. So you go from low to no racial diversity. Yes. And I'm also going to make a, a third assumption, which is urban Miami has some more racial diversity. <laughs> you think? So, so all of a sudden, <laughs> you're in this school teaching what age? What age are you starting at? Sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth. Oh, my God goodness so you're in like the yeah. intense middle school yeah. years yes from you know midwest small town yes. yes college thing how did that i mean was that just a shock to the system i mean oh, you just walk in the door you have no idea it was it was unbelievable not only was it unbelievable but i was hired to teach computers and i didn't know how to turn <laughs> one on <laughs> honest to god I did not know how to turn one on. Computers had just entered the education world and they they took this kid who's young, good GPA, he can learn anything, and I didn't know how to turn one on. So not only was I completely, you talk about a fish out of water. I mean, my nickname is Fish because I'm my last name, Fisher. My whole life I've been called Fish. I was a fish, totally fish out of water. And then dealing with the with with, with, the, with you know with the class. I mean, we had seventeen year olds in ninth grade. You know because oh man, you know just the challenging, challenging, challenging area. Yeah, Jay, I I cried myself to sleep many, many, many nights. I can't imagine. I was I mean, twenty two. I, I, I left can't my get family my family behind. Around. I'm here just with my friend, and I got no family. I got no, I, you know, my friend. Thank God for my friend, but that's my mm. only support system. Yeah. I'm 22. I'm just a kid and, and and just overwhelmed by life and the city and the urban experience. And, you know, the school I was at was 90% African-American, 9% mm. Hispanic and 1% white. And that was me. 
<laughs> wow. So overnight, you're just in this thing overnight, going for it. Overnight. Wow. And so when you think back on that, like right now, if you could grab, you were 22, you could grab that 22-year-old kid and you could say, hey, Kevin, come here a minute. You're about to walk in this classroom, about to take this job. I got 10 minutes to tell you something. Here's something I want to tell you. What, what would you want to tell that kid now? You're going to make it. Hmm. It's going to be hell. And it's going to be tough in the first couple of years. But with God on your side, you're going to make it. And you're going to have a, if you stay true, you're going to have an impact on those kids. That's going to be life-changing. Hmm. Yeah, because I bet, I mean, I mean, in any school, the kids test the teacher. That's just mm. part of the deal, right? Mm. Like, you know, I, I was that kid, if I'm being entirely honest. Like, so like. <laughs> like surprise, surprise. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, any school, kids are going to test the teacher, especially the new teacher, especially a young new teacher. So yes. any school. Yes. Then yes. if it's like, you know, this is young white guy in our yes. black school. Oh, yes. man, we are going to run this guy. Through. Yes. Yes. Like, and we're coming for him. Yeah. And you know, I didn't look extremely old. I mean, I was 22, <laughs> but, you know, baby face. Right. Yeah, you're 22. You look their age, effectively. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so yeah. it's like, and then I'm going to be teaching. I mean, what a crash course in, like, teaching, let alone diversity and cultural attunement and awareness of how different people think and live and all of that jay was it was absolutely overwhelming when i think back about it uh, yeah. just just parachuted in to i, I mean I, I parachuted in a whole new country for that matter i mean yeah, yeah. Not, i mean miami in itself is not the united states to start with right and, and so you got you got <laughs> right. you got miami to deal with and then you've got this this subculture within the bigger city culture to deal with it was wow i mean i, mean, I parachuted into it to a to a foreign country it was it was they spoke english most of them but right. outside of, outside of that, there was nothing normal in my in, in my world. And how did your project of being the best volunteer ever go? Like, did you find a church that you're like, man, at least I've got these people? Uh, yes, I, I I developed. Thank God, uh, mm. I developed some some quick friendships in in a church we we became part of. They had a strong mm. uh, single adult ministry, and uh, I developed some quick friendships that were. Mm life saving. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and you know it's it's interesting listening to you. I just think it, some of it's generational, but there's something about being 22, like from 18 to like 30. Like taking risks like that are so worth it if you have a strong faith and you can find a support system of some kind. <laughs> because it's really hard to do that stuff later it can be done but if you're going to take a risk what a moment to take a risk and, and and i'm sure your parents i mean you're calling back to your family how are they oh, yeah. processing this are they like what are you doing well my mom and dad again were, were you know all in followers of jesus as i right. was right and i had a clear word from god to, yeah. to be at this school mm. and they knew that that helps so they, yep. yeah absolutely so they they supported Hmm. you know, my decision that, you know, they just heard me cry and just kind of talk me through it and say, it's going to get better. And wow. And it did get better, but it took three years to get better. Wow. So how long did you teach their total? Six and a half. I taught six years through summer school. Wow. And then, then transitioned to where I am today. Dude, that I was going to say, so tell me how you bump into the vineyard then. So you're going, you found a church. Yeah. So I bumped into the vineyard, Jay, back in college. Oh, okay. Interesting. Jerry, our chaplain was from Southern California originally, and he got his degree at Fuller. Oh, okay. And he was he was you know he was well rounded in his in his 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 Christianity, mm. and he knew that Reformed Church of America was a small slice of the pie. Mm -hmm. So he wanted to give us on on, on campus a, a a more broadened experience, and so mm. he invited he invited the Vineyard, Steve Robbins. 
early vineyard pioneers. Really? Steve Robbins came to our campus my junior year and did what the vineyard does. A couple of people came with him. Uh, Jerry Sitzer had a series of meetings in the evening and seven o'clock and, you know, vineyard came in their blue jeans, you know, which of course I wasn't real familiar with because <laughs> even at home, we had to dress up for church a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, but jeans and a t-shirt played the guitar, did a simple message from the gospel. And then, and then they, and then they did, they said, okay, we're going to take, we're going to just take a moment now. Let's stand. And, and, and uh, this is all new to me, just, just new to me. Now it's normal, but it was new then. And, and I'm watching, you know, the, you know, they said that come Holy Spirit. And I'm watching these college students that I knew, I knew they had zero background in, in the Holy Spirit stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm watching them. I watch their hands start trembling because they're not, they're not doing this by knowing how to do this. And they've right. never seen any, they never seen yes. anybody do this. So to me, it was a virgin audience. And it was so, it was for me just to watch this happen because I saw this stuff growing up, but they didn't right. see any of this stuff. Mm. And I watched the Holy Spirit move and I watched the style for the first time in my life, I saw a package I could embrace. Mm. And so I told, I told Debbie, then I said, this, 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 mm. it, this is what I've been looking for. Mm. So that happens in college. Yep. And the oh. vineyard got kicked off campus after three days. The chaplain, Jerry Sitzer, almost lost his job. Ooh, wow. Um, I heard, I heard that he almost right. lost his after job. After the fact, right, yeah. Yeah, because it just, you know, the, I think now the school would embrace it, I think, with so much more readily now, I would, I right. would think. But it, was but, a, it was a stretch. It was, but back you know, in the day, back in the right. day, it was a stretch. But, but for me, I said, there, I saw, hmm. I saw the, the Holy Spirit move in people's lives in power without the package hmm. or in a package I like. Yeah. And I said, that's me. I could do that. So hmm. that, that happened. Three days gone. Whoop, thought, oh, that was a nice, you know, yeah, moment that was kind of cool. Yeah, that's something to remember, I guess. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Right. right. <laughs> Never in my wildest dreams did I ever think. Mm. So, so I'm, so I'm teaching school, kind of bouncing around from local church to local church here in Miami. And then a guy by the name of Jim Bricker moves from Indianapolis, Indiana to Miami to start a vineyard church. Mm. Well, I don't know how I heard about, how do you hear about that in a city of three, four million people totally. before social media? Anyway, a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend told me there's this dude starting a vineyard church. I said, vineyard church? I said, like, could it be the vineyard I was back in college? And wow. So we showed up at Jim's living room on a Tuesday night, I think it was, seven people. My wife Debbie and I made nine. Hmm. And it was just like it was in college. Wow. And Jim shared the gospel because he didn't know me. He didn't know my wife. He, you know, who were we? Yeah. He didn't know I was in church most of my life and so, but I loved, I loved the sharing of the gospel. Mm. I loved the way it was. I said, I loved the dream. And I said, honey, we found our spot. Mm. So I was still teaching school. But it's a little, night. it's a little church plant thing, right? Yes. It's not even, yes. it's nothing dynamic. There's no, no cool building or logo or you know, Nothing. website or, yeah, it's just, it's just like a little crew of people. Yeah. And then Jim had to delay the church because he couldn't just come to Miami to plant a vineyard back in mm. the day without, without apprenticing somewhere. Mm. So he found out that he found out that Jack Little had mm -hmm. relocated to Boca Raton, Florida, mm. which is about an hour and a half from Miami. Yeah. So Jim moved to Boca Raton to go on, to go on staff with him for about a year. Hmm. All the while, he kept a few small groups happening in Miami-Dade, and I was leading one of those small groups for him. Hmm. But we would drive to Boca Raton, hour and a half each way to church for a year and a half. Wow. To go back and forth to go to church when, when we discovered the vineyard, because it was just it was just who we were, and we were we were committed. Dude, I mean, and you know, you probably know this, but in every one of these conversations we're having with folks, when they talk about finding themselves in the vineyard, Nearly every time it's a story like this, like I just knew this is my home. These yeah. are my people. This yeah. is my family. And it's not usually the trappings. It's not like, man, it was this one worship song or gosh, the preaching was so outstanding or, you know, they had this incredible 
whatever, you know, fill in the blank, you know, way about them or this theological thing that really hooked me or it's this kind of combination of things, some worship, some, but it's more like a, a sense of how the spirit has brought you to family that you didn't know you had. Like, yeah. this is my family. Yeah. This feels like home. It's like pretty much everybody that that does this thing in the vineyard that's been true of, which, again, I think is kind of unusual. That's not always true for every church background. That doesn't mean it's better. It's just, it's unique. It's fascinating. So, okay, so now you're leading a small group. The church plant kind of finally starts to launch. How do you end up? getting sucked into, <laughs> into this because you're you're teaching you're probably finally getting your legs under you like it's starting yes. to work i'm figuring yes. it out yes i like where i'm at you're yes. i'm sure i can't imagine how much you have changed in that process mm. like your kind of attunement to different cultures and mm. economic backgrounds and i mean because as you teach in that environment now you're connected to families and worldviews you've probably never rubbed up against and it's becoming your life like these are my people and yeah so how do you get sucked in how do they how do they pull you into being a pastor how does that happen well because god shows up Hmm. and speaks so jim we went for a little walk behind his place one day and he said look i feel called to go back to indianapolis to plant another vineyard church which he's still there doing that now yeah and he said you know, I, I'm looking for somebody to take this church over. Mm. And he said, I'd like it to be you. Mm. I was 27. I said, dude, what are you thinking? Like what you've been smoking? Like <laughs> this can't be God. This has got to be like you drinking. What do you, what have you been doing, right, dude? Totally, this is crazy. Totally. <laughs> and then I rattled off for him five other dudes at the church, currently mm. at the church at that time, because the church was about a couple hundred people, 200 people mm-hmm. at that time. I rattled off five other dudes' names who could do it better than me mm. and instead of me. Mm. He said, he said, yeah, yeah, I, I hear you, but but I, I just sense God calling you. So mm. and Jim was in a hurry. And not not in a big hurry, but you know, he, he had some intentionality. So he said, You got two weeks to make a decision. Mm. And uh so just a quick just a quick story. My wife and I, we, we it was a it was a, a two week break between regular school and summer school. We flew back to see our families in Iowa and Wisconsin. And a couple of things happened. First thing that happened, because I said, God, God, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be a pastor. I was a career school teacher. Mm-hmm. I was on that track. Mm-hmm. I got my master's degree in computer education. I worked hard to get that while I taught. And and I was I was ready to go. But so you'll appreciate this. It was, it was, it was on a golf course. <laughs> I do appreciate that. <laughs> I yeah, I like to play golf. I mean, you and I haven't played yet together, but no, hopefully one day we will. So I played golf in Iowa on an unfamiliar course on a very windy day with borrowed clubs. Hmm. It was nine hole course, and for the first time in my life, I shot even par. Wow, that's good golf. But that's what I said. I was, you know, I was, you know, fl- but never even par. And, and I, I just, and it was, it was like, it wasn't even like work. It just like mm. happened. Mm. And I'm walking off the green and I, I hear God speak and say, look, you didn't shoot that round of golf. I shot that round of golf through you. Mm. And that's how it's going to be in ministry. You don't think you're qualified. You don't think you have what it takes. You don't think you could ever do it, but it's not about you. It's about me. Mm. And boom, my whole world changed. Mm. Still, still wasn't enough for me. God knew that. So, because because if I'm going to make this career change and become a pastor, I got to. Yeah. I just can't have some thoughts off a golf course. So, so I'm at my in laws' house. I sit straight up in bed at in the middle of the night, which I don't ever do. And I hear God again. He says, "Look, I want you to take the job with the vineyard, and to prove it to you, your son Michael." who was seven months old at the time, is going to be saying, Dada, before you guys fly back to Miami in 10 days. Wow. So, so in 10 days, my seven-month-old son, who's, you know, doesn't say Dada, doesn't say anything, just drools a lot, starts saying Dada so clearly and so powerfully that both sides of the family said, this is like a child prodigy. Kids don't talk at this age. They don't wow. have any idea what's going on, but I know exactly what's going on. Mm. 
Do you know when we hit the tarmac and land in Miami, my son Michael stopped saying dad that cold to who was about 10 or 11 months old. Wow. Just for those 10 days. It was do 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 do. Yeah, so weird stuff. I mean, this is weird stuff, but it's confirmation. You need that yes, cuz Yes, yes. You yes, love yes. what you do and so I needed that. I needed that. Yeah, and what I had my a answer. gift. Wow. I had my answer. Wow. So I walked into my principal put a letter of resignation on the tape. He said, "What is this?" I said, "I don't even know." Hmm. But I I got to follow what I'm doing. He gave me a chance at the end of summer school to talk, mm. to come in, come in and talk to the fa- the whole faculty staff. Because mm. back in the day, I raised support, helped raise support for my first six months on staff, and wow. I asked the faculty if they would be willing to contribute for for six months, and several of them stepped up. Wow! And contributed to me being a pastor on staff. Wow! So it was a wild time. month, we introduce a new book or recommended resource to dig in deeper. For the last quarter of 2023, we'll be focusing on gospel proclamation. And this month, we're recommending that you read The Gospel Precisely by Matthew Bates. The Gospel Precisely is available wherever books are sold. Dude, that's incredible. That's amazing. What an amazing story. And... Yeah, I mean, I what I love is the way you describe the prophetic because, you know, people often be like, well, I need God to tell me what to do. But what you had is the prophetic was like a like a highlighter, like yeah, God spoke to you in ways to confirm what you yeah. were sort of putting in front of him. Yeah. As opposed to it being like a right turn, like, you know, I suddenly have this dream. It's like Jim does this thing like, wait a minute. I'll pray about that. And then confirmation, confirmation, confirmation. You know, he just keeps confirming things. But it's still a big risk. I mean, that isn't like easy. I mean, it's still like, wow, this is a financial risk. This is a career risk. It's personal. Like, I love what I do. Yeah, never. it never gets so clear that it doesn't cost, does it? I was hired for half the salary that I was making as a teacher. Wow. Full time. And I had a child and a wife and another one on the way. Wow. And uh, it just was, uh, but I knew what God spoke. Yeah. I, you know, I was young enough and naive enough mm. to know wow. that if God, if God speaks, I'm in. He's got he, to worry about the rest. Okay. So then tell me, you take over, and I know some of the story of your church. So let's pivot a little bit because- yep. You know, as you're leading, the Lord starts to speak to you pretty clearly about unchurched people, people that are far from God. Because as you said, you know, sometimes, specifically vineyard churches, but really any church, have been sort of involved in the renewal space. They're encountering the Holy Spirit. Many of the folks that come into the church would actually be like your story. Like yes. people that have been raised in church, they have, a, they have a real life with God, they have some experiences with the Holy Spirit, and they realize, man, there is more than this. And they find a vineyard because it's either less weird or not weird in a way that they can encounter and experience God, which is great. I mean, that's a great thing. We want to build disciples, make disciples. But often what that becomes then is a way that we're just sort of managing the people that are there and we sort of lose track of the cities that we're in the unchurched folks people that are far from god people have never had an opportunity to hear the gospel and with you being a teacher your heart has been broken now for your city you you can't just be in that school like that and then be in church and forget that that whole world is still out there i'm sure something got seeded into you in that experience something but what you just described that, that was me. Hmm. That was me. That's who I was as a pastor. What you just described was me. Hmm. I was, if you're a follower of Christ, if you're a Christian, you want to go deeper, you want more, you want to be passionate for Christ, I'm your man. Hmm. But honestly, Jay, I, I did not have 
an idea. I didn't have a concept. I, I, I did not have a, a desire mm. for those who, who didn't know Jesus. I just, that personally, that's not a reflection on Jim. Jim Bricker was very evangelistic. I wasn't up to that time. I was mm. different. And, and I had kind of a, you know, more Lord kind of a church happening. Mm-hmm. And, and so one day, <laughs> Mm. another powerful encounter by God. But this one was more, this was more like a Pauline experience where he saw a bright light. Mm. I can just, out of nowhere, I'm making lunch at my house and my day off on a Monday. I remember where I'm standing at the kitchen counter. And all of a sudden I start, I just start crying. Mm. And my family thinks I'm having a nervous breakdown. I don't know exactly why I'm crying but I'm thinking God's involved. Yeah. And over the next three days, God revealed to me his heart for people far from him, his mm. heart for people who don't know him. All the people I judged, all the people I put in boxes, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. That's who I was. Mm. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I was, you know, I was, I was a Pharisee who went to Matthew's house and said, you know, the Pharisees go to the disciples and says, how, how come Jesus hangs around with such scum? I would have asked that question. Mm. I would have been the one to ask that question. But these three days, Jay, I cried, I wept, I broke. I didn't quite give language to it. I didn't know what's happening, but I mm. know that God was doing a massive change in the inside of me mm. for his heart for the lost and those far from him. And I began to come out of that. I was just in a kind of fog for three days. It was a wild, crazy experience. Mm. But I came out of that with changed. I, I, I was just changed. Mm. I started seeing verses in the Bible and stories in the Bible I never saw before. I've never read the Bible multiple times. I started seeing God's heart for people. And I, I, I just started weeping and breaking over people who I'd walk into a restaurant and I, I, I'd look around and I'd think, oh, there's 50 people here. I wonder if they have a church to go to. Mm. I wonder if they know Jesus. I wonder if they even know. Wow. I wonder if they know how much God loves them and cares about yeah. them. Or, is even on the radar screen. And, and so began my journey of, we call around here, the value of one more. Mm. That we're always looking for one more because Jesus is always looking for one more. Mm. And so began my journey into this world of saying, okay, all right, all right, God, if this is, if this is the passion you've given me now, and it is, and it never went away, how can how can I, because my world now is church, how can I create, design, orient a, a, a weekend meeting that I could invite people to and yeah. that we could invite people to that wouldn't freak them out like I did growing up in the church I grew up in mm-hmm. but, and had some meaning and had some more significance, some of the churches I was a part of. Mm-hmm. But how can we do that? How can we do that? How can we do that? Mm. And so begin my journey. I'm not, I'm not saying I have all the answers. I'm not yeah. saying I had all the answers. I'm not saying anything like that. All I can say is God has been faithful to, yeah. to, to, to allow the Miami Vineyard Church to be a catalytic church mm-hmm. that people invite their friends to. They invite yes. their, their friends that don't know Jesus to, that they come here. And, and on almost every weekend at the end of the service, there will be an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. And yes. almost every weekend, Jay, before COVID, we had twice as many. Since COVID, we were cut in half. We've still got online stuff, but but you know, there's there's between five and ten people every weekend. Wow! Who, who scan a QR code at the end of the service because they have said a prayer at the end to say, "I want Jesus today." Yes. Now that was you know I'm, I'm just summarizing last twenty years. Oh of no, that's that's a beautiful summary. And you know we um, a little bit ago I interviewed Rich Nathan and we talked a little bit about how to make a call and what are some ways people can respond and no matter what you're doing can you just take a minute directly address the audience of people who don't have faith maybe they came with a friend whatever just really intentionally try and doesn't matter what you're teaching on find a way in the sermon and that the call often for people to give their life to christ has to be separated you know, intentionally from what we're used to in the vineyard, which is a ministry call. 
Yes. Because it's a different audience. You know, they yes. just, they, they're listening differently. They're, yes. they're trying to understand what's going on differently. Yes. But what's interesting is in that podcast, one of the things Rich talked about, and he emphasized it more than once, was something that you're describing in your story, which is he, he'd said it at least two or three times, which is to, to pastors, ask God in prayer to give you this heart mm. to change something in you. Because I think pastors can be persuaded by the argument, like, well, I guess mm. we're supposed to do this. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, we should care about our city. And, you know, there's some guys out there that do this. And I'm learning some ways to think about having the follow-up card or the thing or the call or, you know, we're, you know, even, even some like, hey, we're going to we're going to do alpha. You know, we want to try to mm -hmm. try some things. It'll help yeah, people. Absolutely. All great. Yes. All important. Yes. Y yes. You know, yes, yes. do all the things. Yes. But the thing you're describing is just true. Uh, I mean, when I know pastors who have, you know, real fruit in the life of their church of seeing people come into life with Jesus. One hundred percent of the time. It's because something happened to them. Something happened that the Holy Spirit just put a hook in them and said, hey, I love all this stuff you do. And you're going to do all the things you do. You're going to pastor people. You're going to help them raise their kids. You're going to work on their marriage. You're going you're gonna to teach them the Bible. This is good. This is good. So it isn't like we're not doing that. But this other thing, pastor, you've got to tell people about me. You've got to make a way that what you do happens for those who bring their friends in the meetings and then really in your life. You've got to be this kind of human. <laughs> and that only happens by and large as God puts a, a hook in people. Something yeah, no, happens like you're describing. Uh, yeah, I, I can't absolutely have to agree with that. I mean, to me, the, the heart of the issue is an issue of the heart. Yes. It was for me. It just was for me. I just, I just, I just didn't, I, I didn't care about those far from Christ. I right. cared about those who were, but I didn't care. I didn't. And I, and, and God had to just break me, change me. And I am, <laughs> Jay, I'm just a different, I'm a different man. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm, but I'm, I'm but I'm so much more compassionate than I was and I'm so much mm. more loving than I was and mm. my wife my wife says yes I like this new Kevin better than the old one yeah and, yeah. and so my whole world changed my whole church changed mm -hmm. what we what we do changed to some degree mm -hmm. and how we do church changed to some degree and we've had a lot of trial and error and a lot of a lot of a lot of, lot of things but but sure. but you know we're I would like to challenge, just to, just to challenge pastors. We we are we are called to a city or a community. We yeah. we're, we're not we're not called to be a holy huddle. We are called by God to pray for that city. We're yes. called to a city to make a difference in that city. And it's not just to gather up, you know, unchurched believers or believers that want more. We're mm. gathered to make an impact in that city. To 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 call people to Christ, to, yes. to compel them to come in that my house may be full, yes. but also then to impact the community, impact the city and be a light and let your light shine. Because if mm. you are being a light and you are letting your light shine, people are going to want to come to your church. That's right. And if they come to your church, what are they going to find? So if, you, if we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, they're going to come to your church. Yes. What are they going to find? Yes. What's what? What are they going to experience? What's going to be their experience what, when when they walk in the doors? What what is what is this whole experience going to look like? What's it going to be? And so it forced me, yeah, to see it mm -hmm. through the lens of someone who doesn't know the Bible, doesn't mm -hmm. know God, mm -hmm. has never been to a church before. What does this experience look like for them? What does it feel like for them? Yes. And when we begin to think those kinds of thoughts, be ready, because you might have to do some things in your church that 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 say no to some stuff yeah, <laughs> say yes totally. to some other stuff totally. make some changes because if we're going to say yes to those folks and I'm saying yes I'm saying yes in all caps 
then then what does this what does this experience look like? Yeah. It changes things. And what I love about your story, because a lot of people that are kind of more thoughtful about unchurched folks, it's because that's their story. You know, they they've lived in that skin a certain way. But what's so great about your story, Kevin, is that you have this kind of nice Christian experience through your life. Like it isn't like, you know, you know, the next thing I knew I was deconstructing and living, you know, in the gutter and, you know, I came back to Christ. And so therefore, which I think is important because it, it, you don't have to have your faith fall apart to really care about people that are far from God. Um, yes. You just most don't. Pe- most people I speak with think that's my story. Right. They just they just can't believe that's not my story. <laughs> right. Well, because often that is the story. And so your your real encouragement, I think, to pastors to say, you can ask God for this. God can put yes. this in you. Yes. He can do it. He yes. can do that. If you if you're willing and you really want him to, you can. Yes. But to your point, it will it will tend to mess up other things. <laughs> <laughs> just be, okay the, to, to, be ready <laughs> that's yeah, well that well that so say more about that like because again i know some about your your own experience i'm sure some folks in your church weren't super thrilled as they you started not. to shift stuff so they were not what starts to change like in you in the life of the church and how do people start to react and respond to that yeah so you know i was thankfully smart enough to not like you know, spin the ship overnight. <laughs> right. You know, we had a couple hundred people at that time, and right. and uh, you know, I I I I couldn't lose those couple hundred people because I changed right. the entire direction of the church. So it was just a gradual, gradual, gradual. It was seeding. It was seasoning. It was yeah. me on the weekend sharing God's heart for the city, sharing God's mm. heart for people, just seasoning my messages. I don't necessarily, you know. It wasn't like I did a whole series on this, but it was seasoning messages now differently than I seasoned them before. Yeah. Seasoning them with eyes to see who aren't here yet and love and compassion and mercy for those not here yet. Yeah. And, and what and seasoning them with God's call to the city. And so, but then there's also some, so that seasoning messages, but then there was some tweaking. I mean, because, and I didn't do it alone. I, I learned from people around me who were, who were already doing this. I had some great coaches and I went to places and traveled and flew and saw and sat through their services. And yep. I said, I said, let me feel this. I got to feel this. And it's like, yep. oh, then I'd meet them afterwards with a barrage of questions. Why do you do this? Why do you do this? Yeah, Why do you do this? Why totally. do you do this? So, so I did all of that. And so, but, but I made some changes. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, a person that doesn't know Jesus and doesn't know God and doesn't know anything, you know, it's hard for them to sing songs about Jesus and about God for, right. A certain length of time yeah totally so we did a little gradual it was gradual but we had to pare the the length of a worship experience down because yeah. they can't sit there we, we were worshiping 45 minutes back in the day right and that's great if you're a follower of christ but it's it's awkward if you're not right so we little by little by little we pared that back mm. i pared back the length of my messages that I gave. I was speaking for 45 minutes and I, I paired them back to 30 over time, over time, because again, does a person want to sit there that long? Right. And then obviously we changed hospitality around in huge ways because, yeah. you know, when, 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 when it's just people, you know, you know, whatever, come on in, hang out. Hey, right. hey Mario, yep. right. you know, Jose, how are you, man? Good to see you. Fist bump. But when you're welcoming new people, that changes everything. Yes. So it was a complete transformation with hospitality and and welcoming people and and that whole kind of thing. But again, it wasn't like overnight. It was years, years, yes. years, years. But to be to be honest with you, Jay, I lost all but five of the first two hundred people when I made wow. this change over time. Over time, right? Because they did. And 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 in all fairness, they didn't sign up for this. Yes. Right. But but so but they and they and they they had a hard time because they came. They came for a different reason to the church, and they totally. didn't want. They didn't want to. They didn't want to go on the journey with me. I mean, you know, yep. Wimber. You know, Wimber has always said, you know, our values and what we do are either bridge or a barrier. And so, yeah, for all but five, it became a barrier, not a bridge. But yeah, but, but new people came. New people came, and new people came. But it. But I can be honest with you, Jay. It, it the challenge never goes away. Yeah, because it just doesn't. You 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 
you know, somebody comes to Christ and, and all of a sudden they want something else and yes. they want more and they want this and they want that and i'm going don't you remember where you were six months ago totally totally don't you remember that what we offered to you in this setting in this moment was 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 it just you're here because of that totally but but our, but, but we just like we just forget we forget we what do. it was like we forget we what do. it's like and so yes. you know not that people can't grow listen weekends it's not it's not weekends are for both weekends are for seasoned saints weekends are for those far from christ we're just yes. aware and conscious and putting some elements into our weekends that are conscious conscious of of of, of your friends and your guests who are here today totally well and you know, if, if pastors want a little experiment, I always encourage pastors to ask folks in their church why they aren't inviting yes. the people they work with and their neighbors. Yes, yes. Even if you have to do it anonymously, just tell me the truth. And if they're inviting, how? what do your friends say afterward? Give me real feedback. Like, what yes. do they say when they come what is it that works? What is it that doesn't work? Because we all know the experience of bringing a guest the first time. I I, I often call it the cringe factor. Like, <laughs> exactly. like I, exactly. I, I feel fine about what we're doing until my neighbor that I've invited 30 times into different things we do shows up on a They're there in the lobby. Okay. Yes. Yes. Like I'm actually... In kind of in charge, right? And even I go, wait a minute. Yes. What are we doing today? Yes. What, what's the song set? And I'm watching them at a distance. Like, did somebody tell them where their kids go? And are they making sure that's going okay? And, you know, did someone greet them? And are they sitting in a place that makes sense? And, you know, did they, well, what do we have in the announcements today? Do we have something that's going to be helpful? To you know, all these things just change. And then, yes. and then as I'm watching worship, I'm going, yes. what is that lot? What does that word even mean? Like, yes. what, you know, you know, yes. but, but if, again, I'm just being honest as a pastor. I often don't remember that unless I am personally yes. inviting people. Yes. Jay is. Yes. And they're coming. Because yes. I have to think to myself then every week, what if they come this week as I'm preparing this message, as I'm thinking through my intro, I'm thinking through the sermon series, Am I? do I have those people in my head, in my heart, and then are my leaders inviting people? Yes. So are the people that are running the cafe bringing their friends? Are the people that are leading worship bringing their friends from the gym? from where they work, from their yes. neighborhood. Yes. Because if they are, they think differently. <laughs> they, they pray differently. They prepare differently. And if they're not, mm -hmm. if they're not, I need to know that too. I need to know, okay, why not? Mm -hmm. um, and it's a pretty much every week, I'm sure it's true for you too. Pretty much every week, someone will come up to me, usually in the front of the room or if I'm in the lobby meeting people, and kind of anxiously, they're like, Hey, Jay, I want you to meet so-and-so. And they're pleading with their eyes, like, I really hope this is a good week. You know, they're, they're, <laughs> they're not saying it, but they're, you know, I can see the desperateness in their face. Like, yes. Jay, this is a big deal. This is my yes. coworker. This is yes. my yes. friend yes. 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 from yes. high school that I've known 20 years. Like, and then sometimes they'll be a little more bold and they'll be like, what are you talking about today? Like maybe their friends are over getting coffee. <laughs> what are you doing today, Jake? Because my friend's here. You know, and they're <laughs> mm -hmm. and I realize as a pastor, I have an agreement every week. We have an agreement. You're, I'm hoping that our church is thinking I'm bringing my friends. Mm -hmm. But I'm also on the other side of that agreement saying I'm thinking about your friends. Yes. I'm thinking about your mom. If you bring them, here's what I promise you. That's right. That's right. I'm going to speak to them graciously. I'm going to make a way that they can get a glimpse of who Jesus is. Yes. And there's going to be a moment, there's going to be an opportunity mm -hmm. that I'm going to invite them mm -hmm. to consider what it would look like to trust their whole life to Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's our agreement. I'm going to do my part. You're doing your part. Mm -hmm. And if in any way one of us is breaking that agreement, we got to talk about that. <laughs> we have to talk about like, why aren't we inviting or why aren't we addressing people in that manner? 
And can we be honest enough to, you know, assess that and adapt that? And, and again, we might not get everything done in every room. So I want to be a Holy Spirit people. So we're going to have Holy Spirit classes. We have encounter nights that if you bring your friend to encounter night, I don't know what to tell you. You probably shouldn't have done that because because <laughs> that's a different room. We're doing something different there. It's we're a different space. We're praying for the sick. We're going to have training on all the Holy Spirit stuff. And hopefully some of that ministry moves in toward our Sunday gatherings. But it's a different room. That's yes. a different room. It exists yes. for a different reason. We're not able to do everything in every room. And we have to think about our Sunday as a family meal where we have guests. Like, you know, when my family is a meal and we don't have guests, whatever. You know, we might post in front of the TV. <laughs> you know, like exactly. we, you know, we, we put our exactly. feet on the furniture. <laughs> like, exactly. whatever, you know. But when we have guests, you know, we clean everything up. We make sure like the table set right. We think about what allergies they might have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we, mm -hmm. we, we welcome them at the door. We have different options for drinks. You know, we're not just pulling something out of the fridge and warming it up. You know, like we're, we, you know, we've, we've curated a moment. So, but it's still for my family. It's not just for the guests. Mm -hmm. We're solving yes. a family meal. Yes. Yes. And, and I know there's some things you've talked about. I remember hearing your great talk where you talked about signs and wonders. <laughs> you know, we were doing the, the, the whole thing was on thinking about people who don't normally come to church and evangelism. And I think your talk was called Signs and Wonders. It was. So tell, tell me what signs and wonders are, because that's, that's familiar vineyard language. Yes. <laughs> but you use it as a, like an interesting spin. Yes, yes. So before I go there, just one comment on what oh, you yeah, just yeah, sure. said. Of course. This, I think this has been helpful for me. It's been helpful as I've spoke to people at our church, mm. and it might be helpful for some pastors out there. When you talked about different spaces and different places that things yep. happen, one of the lines I use over and over again is, here at the Miami Vineyard, we do it all. We just don't do it all on the weekend. Yeah. Because everybody wants everything to happen on the weekend. Yeah, totally. But there are different, different places, different spaces for things to happen, but we do yep. it all. Yes. We just don't do it all on the weekend. Totally. And that's, hel that's helpful for people and helpful for people attending and helpful for people yes. to understand. So I, I just want to drop that out there. But, that's good. No, that's a really good frame. It's a good phrase. Back to signs and wonders. Yeah. So I just, I, I, you know, I stole the vineyard phrase from Wimber and everything else. Vineyard totally. For signs and wonders. But, but I talked about literal signs, signage, signage, <laughs> literal signage. signage. I love signage. this. I love and it. I said, I, 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 and I, I encourage people in my talk, you know, we, we, you know, we went into great detail about all these different things that we do at our church to give, to give. Oh, and you do so people. many great things. Truly you do. I mean. And, and I said, if you, if you had, listen, listen I, I challenged people. I said, look, if you just have the right signage, you're going to wonder where all the people came from. <laughs> so signs and wonder, signs and wonder. <laughs> it's so great. Yeah. And so you do. You have yard signs you offer yes. for people. You have signs that help people from the road if they're driving by, like, hey, here's the way in. Here's how you actually might get into the building. These things sound silly, but boy, they're a big deal. Like, and when you're in the building, here's where you go. And here's what, you know, like, here's what the kids thing is. And here's what's going to happen in your experience today. And then every day you have, you give everyone, this is, again, you're just great with words. You give them a six pack on the way out. Yes. In fact, we're giving up brand new six packs this weekend. <laughs> okay. So what's a six pack? I love Brand this. newly designed six packs. It's, it's Bud Light. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not. What is it? What is it's it? It's not. It's not. It's a, it's a, we buy these little clear plastic sleeves and mm -hmm. in there are six business size cards right and mm -hmm. and on the card is front and back it just is a in fact i i, I don't even I, I i didn't our team designed the new one so i i can't even remember exactly what they say but basically it's it's you're invited yeah to my vineyard community church there's yep. a there's a qr code on the back you can scan it has our service times has an address it very it's a very simple 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 tool and, simple and, tool yep so now so i, I tell people look just always have them on you. Always have yeah. them on you. 
Always, always, always have them on you because you don't know what God has been doing in somebody's life behind the scenes. Totally. You don't know. And if we believe the words of Jesus where he says, my father is always at work. He's always at work. He's always at work. If we believe that, then I believe that God is at work in that person's life. I don't know what he's doing or how he's doing it all. So what I tell people, look, look, never go out to eat at a restaurant and leave the tip without putting a card in there. Yeah. You you don't you, you don't have to say anything. Just leave a card in there. You don't know what yeah. God's doing behind the scenes. But don't leave some measly little tip. Leave, leave a tip a generous tip. Yes. And if of you course. leave some if you leave a stingy tip, put a different church's card in there. But yeah. don't, put our, don't, don't put our card in there. <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> and then then look, I said sometimes you're just gonna be in a conversation with somebody and yep. you know, it's you don't you know, it's not like download of, you know, the Bible, but just here's what I, I tell people, because you gotta give people language. They don't know what to say. Right. So I give people a narrative and I say, look. I go to this really cool church. Yep. You might want to check it out sometime. That's it. That's and it. You just hand the card off and yep. you and if they want more conversation, they will. If they don't, almost everybody says thank you and they can do it at what they want to. But totally. But it's but it's a way of planting seeds and it's giving people to me in, in today's world, it's giving people an opportunity to say, I, I'm ev- I'm being evangelistic yes. in this way. In this yes. way. Yeah. Now. You know, are we training all our people to communicate their story and their faith? Yes, we're trying. But yeah. This is a simple way, a simple way in a moment that takes three seconds yes. to say. And then if they come, we've got people, what I tell people to do at every every place of decision where you're how to make a decision to, am I going to go left? I mean, literally walking, navigating left or right, left or right in the building and before the building, every place a person has to make a turn. Yeah. Is there a person and a sign helping them make that turn? Yeah, that's good. Well, it's hospitality. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're demonstrating hospitality. And what I love about your six pack thing is when people think evangelism often our current culture, they're imagining engaging an atheist yes or you know a hardcore muslim who they have to have their apologist hat on like i need to be able to defend why do i believe the bible is true or how do i know that jesus is the only way how would i make an argument that jesus is unique and what he calls us to against the pluralistic world we live in or whatever like somehow they have to have some kind of c.s lewis you know graduate degree to even engage two seconds into a conversation because they're going to be underwater before they even know what happened but here's the thing there those that is a tough there are tough nuts to crack we need people who think about culture and apologetics and sure i mean i love all that the truth is most of the ways that people come to know jesus is low-lying fruit it's like the fruit that's rolling around on the ground it's someone often that's had a dream they've had an encounter with god already or they are going through a crisis in their life and they're asking some questions they might ask before like you know, I might have a lot of money, but what's the point of any of this? You know, my mom just died or my dad's been in the hospital. And I'm starting to wonder, why am I exactly. doing any of this? What's the point of my exactly. life? And they're asking real questions and they're present. And in that, the Holy Spirit's already engaging them. So it's already happening. Yes. And they might even be asking, I'm amazed at how many times this happens. They are even asking the simple question, I wonder where I would go to church. I'm sure you've seen this, Kevin, the more most recent stats that like the Barner Group's putting out is that somewhere around 70% of adults are would go to a church if they were invited. They yeah, say right, that. Yes. I mean, like, think of how crazy that stat is. Like, somewhere around 70%, a little bit low and some of the stats a little bit higher than that. But that there's a spiritual hunger happening right now, definitely coming out of COVID where people are wondering, what is the point of any of this? And, you know, I had a grandpa that I think told me, he was a Baptist guy, he told me something about Jesus at one point, or, you know, I, I, I saw this thing on TV and I've been wondering, or, you know, somebody gave me a link to The Chosen and I watched this show. And I'm wondering, like, I wonder what this is. Where should I go? And so then they look at the yellow pages, they're driving by buildings, they're watching people going in and out of buildings. They're thinking, is that where I would go? And how are those those people seem dressed? 
weird. I don't know if I'd want to go there. They literally don't know what to do. And so one person, one time says, hey, you know, I have this church that's made a big difference in my life. Mm-hmm. It's really made a difference in my life. And I don't know. I don't know if you'd ever be interested, but if you ever want to go with me, I'd love to take you. I think you'd love it. And so some huge percentage of people out there right now would say, okay, now they might not be able to do it that week. You know, maybe they've got soccer with their kid or something, you know. So don't be discouraged when they say, oh man, I'd love, you know, it's not really going to work for me this week. That doesn't mean they don't want to, but it also gives a seed for the Holy Spirit to start working in their life. The amount of people in our congregations, you know, we try to run studies on this stuff. It's usually three to five times they've been invited (laughs) before they come. Somewhere in that number. Oh, for sure. For sure. And then they've, they encounter Jesus. And then, you know, that we find these things out at baptism because we ask a bunch of questions like, what, what brought you here? And how did you end up? Da, 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 and why did you do that? And nearly always it That's was good. through a friend. Nearly always. Sometimes there's an exception. Nearly always it was, of a, a, it took them longer to give their life to Jesus. It wasn't the first Sunday they came. They've mm-hmm. been there a while. And it was usually multiple invitations. So your little tool there enables people to see how it really works. You're most likely not going to end up in an argument about how do you know the Bible's true. (laughs) You're just not not going to. I mean, like, I do this for a living. And like, no one ever even asked me that. (laughs) This is what I do sometimes, but it's really rare. Nearly always. Somebody's like, man, thank you. That means a lot. I appreciate that. And, you know, maybe I would check that out someday. Or maybe they hit a moment where they go, you know, I sh- we should go somewhere for Christmas. We should do something for Easter. Oh, there's some times, Jay, where I'll, I'll debrief with somebody about how you heard about us. It was three years ago. Yeah. They got a Coke. And they had the little card on top of the Coke can on the dashboard of their car for Crazy. three years. Wow. But, but something as the moments you just described happened in their life. Yep. It becomes a moment where I need God. Yep. Number one reason people find church is because of crisis. I need yep. God. Where's that stupid card that I got from those the people? And they go to the dashboard yes. and they find it in their dashboard. Yes. You know, weathered and faded, but they find yep. that card. And and I, 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 t- I can't tell you many people I talk to like that. Isn't it amazing? The Would power of an invitation. Yep. I mean, Jesus are. told the parable to go and scatter seed. We don't know what kind of soil the seeds are going to fall on. Yes. We don't know how soon they're going to take root, but yes. I'm going to scatter all the seeds I can. Well, your church has been such a model for the things we're talking about. Evangelism, thoughtful engagement with the city, and then diversity. You know, the amount of different kinds of people that are in the life of your church, you yeah. know, from all kinds of different backgrounds and ethnic stories and racial backgrounds, which again, like, doesn't just happen. You know, that requires intentional connection, thinking about the environment you're building, the kinds of leaders you're building and cultivating and working with. And so that's another, uh, that's another podcast. I was going to say, I would love to come back. That's what I was just about to say. I would love to come back and talk to you through and talk through with you. How did you think about that? Yeah. And how did you build a culture that has different kinds of people from different backgrounds? But yeah. But I'm just I'm just so grateful for you, Kevin. You've given us a ton of time. Really, really appreciate it. And uh, I'd love to come back if you'd be up for it. I'd be up for it. And uh, hey, just to put an invite out there. Listen, for anybody, any any lead pastors out there, mm-hmm. there's an open invitation to come visit us on a weekend. Cool. And, and if you come visit us, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to take you out to lunch or dinner if you come on Saturday night. I'm going to take you out. I'm going to treat you. And I'm going to give myself, you can ask me any questions you want to ask me about anything. Wow. So I want to put it out there. You're lead pastor. Dude. You want, to come, you want to come in, if you want to come and experience our weekend and ask all the questions you want to ask, come on. Well, and for what it's worth, I've been there. I would highly recommend it. You, ha- you have an incredibly exciting church. I just love your church and I love the, your team. And so that's quite an invitation. And if people don't take you up on that, that's... That's a real shame because they should. Hey, <laughs> they should. Especially between December, January, February, March. 
Yeah, when it's nice and cold. Because we are still in the 80s, baby. We are in the 80s, baby. I love it, Kevin. I love it. Well, I appreciate you so much. I'll, 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 uh, I'll let you go, but I definitely want to follow up as long as you'll let me do another one. All right. Thank you, Jay. All right. Peace to you. The We Are Vineyard podcast is a production from the team at Vineyard USA. If you've been enjoying the podcast, here's a few ways you can help us. Leave us a review on the podcast platform of your choice. This helps more people find us. Connect with us online for additional resources. Our website is vineyardusa.org. And we're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at at VineyardUSA. Thanks for listening. See you next week.